uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm indeed most honored today that I can have a talk about this topic. And today is Thanksgiving, you know, it's a wonderful lunch here, so uh, thank you as well. Now, to kick off this um, very mysterious topic, basically, um, I want to highlight um, a real case. Um, I think probably you can hear it somewhere with the, the uh, mixer that you uh, push up a little bit of uh, the volume. <coughs> but anyway, this is me who is working in the accident the emergency department, which is this patient that came in uh, early this year. He's uh, not old, he's only 53. Take a notice that uh, this side of the, of the body is not moving. And he's the breadwinner of the family. The whole family rely on him. He is a worker, and he came in, just collapsed at home. The left side is not moving, the eyes looking the right side. In those days, we can't do anything, you know, just seeing him, we just have a stroke. And uh, we just uh, probably give him some drugs, and hopefully that uh, he might recover. But now we are more proactive. We can do something. And I will tell you the story later on, how are we going to proceed? Know, to, to save his patient. And uh, in the old days, all these stroke patients, it's just leave them in uh, lying in the hospital, either they couldn't survive, or they might be uh, very uh, severely disabled. Now, if you look at stroke, uh, around the world, you, you, you may be appreciating that uh, there are two types of stroke. One is a um, hemorrhagic stroke, uh, the other is a thrombotic stroke. That means the blood vessels are being uh, blocked off. And the other one is uh, bleeding in the brain. And you have in Hong Kong, we have about uh, 3,000 uh, patients every year uh, that dying from stroke, not taking the account of those who is serious sick uh, in, uh, you know, in other hospitals. And the trend, you look at it, is on the increase. This is from a uh, 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 very old one. The other disease that actually Ranking number one, uh, probably, uh, apart from cancer, is heart disease, heart attack. Heart attack is also on the increase. If you look at the, the trend from 1981 all the way to uh, 2009, and it's getting more and more. And in those uh, un underdeveloped country in Africa, the incidence is pretty high as well. And you are, you are, we are talking about, about 11 or 12 person is dying from heart disease every day in Hong Kong. So uh, it's, it's pretty serious, you know. And in, as you understand that treating this sort of diseases like uh, cancer, stroke and heart disease, we have alternative like open surgery, you know, uh, you can do a cardiac bypass. Look at the cardiac bypass, you know, blood spilling here and then and there and it's pretty risky and uh, inevitably you have a big incision but nowadays we have this you know da Vinci robotic machine that you can just operate using a tiny little hole and you can get inside your body and then you operate but still it's not small enough what we are talking about is this now we are just using a small little hole in the groin and using the machine and, uh, and we are practicing endovascular treatment Okay, uh, and the vasca means you're using the catheter and a guy wire going through a small little tiny little hole and you're going, get inside the, vas the vessels, go up to the head, and there's an aneurysm. We are putting up a stand. We, this is a, a very radio translucent stand and also using a coil to block off this aneurysm, which is a weakness in the blood vessels that causing hemorrhagic stroke. And so we can use this technology to deal with uh, a very serious problem nowadays, and the patient can recover pretty quickly. If I might just speed it up a bit, now we are within an hour, the aneurysm is blocked off, and the patient is cured. We're talking cure, curing the aneurysm. So the aneurysm is really big. Look at that thing there, the big weakness there. <coughs> so with this modern technology, we can treat this. 
Now, apart from just talking about stroke and also heart disease, there are other lumens within our body that we can actually treat. A lot of other diseases. We have a biliary tree, we have a venous system, we have a lymphatic system, which nobody has explored it yet. We have our tub tubular system, which is your kidney, your bladder, and also we have a gynecological tubular system, which is the tubal, uh, the fallopian tube. And there are so many other tubes within our body that we can actually get into the disease part and treat them. The basic idea is actually you have your catheter and then you've got the lumen. Either you're going to enlarge the lumen or you're going to reduce, try to block it off, reduce the lumen to treat certain diseases. So this is the whole idea. If you have a blockage with a clot, you pull the clot out. That means you can treat thrombotic stroke. If you have stenosis of blood vessel, you open it up dilating it, and then we can help we keep the blood vessels or the lumen open, then your system continues to function. Or you have something ruptured, some weakness there, you block it off with some gadgets, like coils, stand, and whatever. And you can use glue to block off some of the uh, arteriovenous malformation. So, <clears throat> and the luminal technology has evolved so much that we can do so many things, like a biliary stand to put inside your biliary tree when your, your bowel got blocked off or you have an abdominal aorta, you can put a stand just to keep uh, the, the aneurysm uh, from bleeding and also we can make use of uh, uh, other gadgets to keep the thing. Now this is a very interesting thing which affects so many people. We can use an endovascular, so this is the uterus, then you can put a cat up there and deploy a stand on both sides. This, this stand will induce thrombosis. And after a few, few months, immediately it will block off. What happened to that is that lady will not be able to give birth to a child. But a lot of people are doing birth control in the world. And also, if you want to do, in the old days we do tubal ligation, ligate the tube so that you can have uh, a birth control. On the other hand, if somebody who have infertility is due to some blockage of the tube, then you could put a stand back in there, reopen up the tube, and then you can give a birth to a child. So this is the impact to the society, it's so great. And this technology is now still evolving. If you think about that, um, Let's see. Next. I think everybody will concern about this. Cholesterol. Today, we have a very high cholesterol diet. <laughs> and I'm quite sure we, we were aware that the blockage of the blood vessel is caused by cholesterol, black, and a lot of other uh, factors. When the blood vessel got blocked off, especially the heart, and you got a heart attack, which is not a good thing. And also, the brain got blocked off, you got a stroke and uh, also you've got stenosis of the brain vessels and you've got another uh, potential stroke. We need to reopen up those vessels or get the clot out. So now here, when you have atrial fibrillation, you can throw up a clot from the heart, going all the way up to the brain, you end up with a stroke. So the treatment nowadays, everybody is so, uh, so familiar with, is called PTCA percutaneous transluminal coronary angioplasty. That means this blood vessel is blocked off, and then you reopen up by putting a balloon there, and then a guy wire, and then you do a uh, balloon angioplasty first, and then place one of a stain. So the left anterior descending artery now reopen up. Uh, the, the patient is doing well with that. So I think this technology has been there for many, many years. Since then, there are so many stents have been developed. Look at that, you know. You have drug eluted stent, you have bare metal stent, then you have absorbable stent, you have bioactive stent, radioactive stent, but none of them actually work. At the present moment, the bare metal stent, well, have problems. Drug eluted stent, because try to improve the metal surface, put some drugs on the surface so that prevent from restenosis. After 10 years, we have to do a study that the metal, you know, that the, the stand itself got problems, got misanosis. And so people are trying to develop 
a polymer that will find dissolve away itself and bioabsorbable. The impact of healthcare, as you understand, this sort of uh, scale is about 5.3 billion US dollars. Just in 1909, has an estimated just for the sales of foreign stamp alone. And uh, also the, the sales continue to increase. And as you understand that, when you put a stand, everybody's happy. The hospital is making money, the doctor is making more money, everybody's happy except the healthcare system because they have to bear more costs about it. So it seems that putting a stand in is the society, you know, is uh, putting a lot of money and everybody's happy, but it's not really the case, unfortunately. To this year, we have a paper that just issued by a randomized controlled trial, uh, which is quite a large trial. It involved 7,000 patients that previously put in a stent in the heart. And it turned out to be, there's no difference whatsoever. You put in a stent, or you don't put in a stent, you just use drug, the result still the same. The death rate still the same. The uh, angina rate probably is still the same. And there's no change whatsoever. So why the, <laughs> what's the point of putting a stand in, in, the, in the heart? So the conclusion is, if you, you, there is no evidence of benefit putting a stand inside. The reason for that is, now we find out, we need to do research. The problem that is the metal itself, especially when you have a cross branch. We still haven't really cracked that problem. How to keep this fork, you know, keep it open with a stand. Look at the stand over there. So there are so many methods. You can have a called the Kulati method, a YV, a YV method, or a crush method, or a kissing method. Try to negotiate that little junction there to keep this thing open. And also you need to have two stand uh, to form a Y shape. So when you have overlapping of stand, always causing problem to that. So people now in the UST, we are trying to develop something different that we can use biodegradable polymer. And everybody's hoping that the stand will dissolve away instead of using metal, because the metal, once you put it in there, you never get it out. And also imagine the heart is moving all the time. When your metal cannot move, so there's certain movement within the stand itself, micro movement. And that movement is going to cause damage to the blood vessels. And so subsequently the blood vessels cause the loose. And then you need to put another stand. But if that is so narrowed, you cannot reopen up the stand, the stand is blocking the um, further catheterization. So it's a big problem. So you need to have something can be dissolved away. And uh, also with some drugs, can stop the restenosis rate. So we need to have other uh, thoughts that we are going to try to think about. And so as other countries, like in Singapore, this is the stand surface in uh, the electronic microscope. This side is smooth, so that there won't be any um, stickiness and there won't be any clot formation or any interval thickening here. This is adherent to the disease uh, blood vessel wall, which is slightly, you know, become uh, texturized, so-called, and then put some drugs on top of that to keep the blood vessels uh, uh, without any uh, restenosis. So this is a clever idea, but it involves a lot of uh, experiment. Experiment needs to be done by animals. Hong Kong has a very lack of animal laboratories. We need to test it on uh, pigs or in, in some big animals, or monkeys, before we can apply it in humans. So people are trying to negotiate those corners by doing a wise thing. But you need to do extensive experiment with it before we can actually launch it to the market. Now, so as for the brain, the brain I'm talking about is those aneurysms, which ruptured and causing hemorrhage. The other one is blockage of the blood vessels, causing severe stroke, a severe um, infarct of the brain. Now, in these two, these two areas, we can operate, but it involves a quite a big operative sites in the head and the surgical trauma usually end up with much longer stay in the hospital and a lot of disability. But now suddenly, just 20 years ago, some clever guy said, hey, why don't we just put in some coils and block it? Put in some platinum coils and block the aneurysm and so we will not rupture again and detach it with an electronic device. And uh, uh, when you put in, uh, this guy is called Guliami. He's now a multi, multi, multi billionaire. He have not just for money, but he have saved so many lives in the world. Just because I just met him 
20 years ago in UCLA. He was just uh, a researcher there and starting off putting the coils in a dock. And I saw that result and I said, oh, this is great. And so we started, I started off here, they went, came back here and started to do this technique. And eventually produce this coil commercially and be make available everywhere. And this coil has saved so much life. Uh, this is called GDC coil, Guliami Detachable Coil. And from him, there are so much modification of the coil with coating, uh, coating coil, coil matrix coil, and then now you open so many different types. You have hydrogel coated coil, you can have different sort of delta wind, you can have uh, some uh, polymer coil developed so that uh, you enhance the thrombosis within the aneurysm and so prevent aneurysm from rupturing. Unfortunately, there are problems. The coil doesn't reconform really to the shape of an aneurysm. The aneurysm is not always ideally like a small little bubble and the neck. The neck could be very wide. And so you can migration of the stain and you, you don't have complete sealing of the neck. And that end up with a recurrence of aneurysm. The, there's still weakness here and then there's another, another aneurysm coming back out. So people are, ah, we better put something new into it. Now, during operation, you can see the coil sticking out because of uh, migration of coil compaction. And so that is far from ideal. So we use the balloon so they pack it much tighter to a seal of this corner. Theoretically, it works, but it doesn't really uh, uh, easy to do. So imagine that you have to put so many gadgets within one vessel's catheter uh, with a balloon and a coil and, and then another catheter. It's a hell of a job. And so uh, we, we managed to do it, but you take about four to five hours before you can really do this completely the operation. You can see that balloon is sticking there and the coil, and uh, the coil sometimes still come out. And you can see both catheters have to get inside and then blow up the balloon, and then you can do the result like this. So some people say, why not? You say using balloon, use a stand to support those coil from prolapsing. So there are various type of stands how to develop day back in uh, 2003, 2004, and the stand actually works. You can very sudden rupturing. This is one of the cases that uh, we've got nasal pharyngeal carcinoma, and, and then uh, there was terrestrial blood coming up from the nose. Within three minutes, almost die on the table. Um, there's a big hole there. We just immediately put a stand in there and stop the bleeding, and it works. So the coil and stand works for a certain situation, but it's not completely ideal. The reason for that is, the stand, there are so many different types of stand. Uh, it works to prevent the coil from coming out, but the stand itself will kinking. This is a very open design. The, the stand is not, you know, a called open cell design, so you, you've got its own defect within it. And so it's uh, the flow. The, the stand also caught some um, funny change of flow, and so uh, the the result will start uh, rupturing. And this is one of the cases that uh, recently follow up. You can see that there's a coil within it, there's a stand there, but still you cannot completely seal off the aneurysm. We don't understand the flow dynamics. That's the reason why in the university we are now studying the flow dynamics. We need to engineer to understand what happening within that curve. Why the blood has to go into that aneurysm and causing uh, rupture. So, we develop something nowadays, this, within this two or three years, a flow diverter. Diverting the flow from the aneurysm. So this is an ordinary stand with uh, open cell design. You can see it doesn't really cause that much flow um, alteration. But in here, you can see that this is, the porosity have changed. And so the flow have changed, the reduced pressure within the aneurysm. And there's calculations in it. That's why we need engineer to calculate what's happening there. There's a flow dynamics uh, formula that we can make to simulate on a computer. So we designed some sort of thing like this. It's called a flow diverter, very high porosity, uh, but without blocking the side branches of the blood vessels. It is very soft, you can turn around corners, and it's small enough to get inside the brain. So it's one of those uh, called pipeline devices that can, we have used for the past two years. Huge big aneurysm like that without a neck. So we put a pipeline device, six months later, completely cured. Patients, is perfect. There's another aneurysm. We have to telescope at least three pipeline there. And after six months, you see this is the 
you stand under x-ray from that and then become like this. So six months is cured. Huge big aneurysm by that. She's a nurse from our hospital. So we put in a, a similar stand for her. This is not exactly called a stand, it's called fruit diverter. From that, six months later, the aneurysm disappeared. So almost like a miraculous cure. The stand actually have transferred or jail, J A I L, jailing the ophthalmic artery, the smaller vessels. Whether that ophthalmic artery, which is supplying the eye, would it go? You know, when the stand suffers from both, or but there must be something going on here that blocking the flow inside, and then this thing disappeared because there are clot within it, and then it starts from both, and then the body starts to reabsorb that aneurysm. That is what we thought. But the recent study has shown that after you put in there, you've got a problem. You've got to be bleeding, a delayed bleeding. So we need to put in coils. So, because of mesh problem. And we need to do more research on this, you know, the behavior of this stain. I just want to rush a little bit, but uh, I think hopefully we get more understanding. The last part, which is a thrombotic stroke. We pass a catheter into the brain, which is into the, the transluminal uh, technology. This is something that we want to do in Hong Kong. We can't do it at the present moment is because it involves time factors. Within three hours, we need to get rid of this clot from these blood vessels, or else you've got permanent brain damage. If you've got a clot in the, in the brain, you need to get it out as soon as possible. But in Hong Kong, we, sh we can do it. It's just the ambulance people, the people which get in the right place, the right time, where the doctors can do it, and also we need to have the gadgets that we can remove the clot. This is a gadget, you know, that just put in a stand-like substance, but it's a catcher. You can catch that, you unsheathe it, and then you can catch that clot, and then pull it all the way out through the, through the groin wound, and then immediately the, the, the patient can start walking again, see? You engage the clot with the stand, and then you retrieve that clot. So, this is uh, the idea that we can retrieve the clot within the lumens. There are so many designs we, we've been uh, doing. I've tried so many different things way back uh, ten, 10 years ago, and there is a snag, there's a problem with it. Because some of the clots start to uh, disintegrate when you're trying to catch it. When it disintegrates, the blood is flowing, and so the clot goes more distal, and it causes more stroke, and uh, do, it's doing more uh, damage than good. Now we designed this called 3D separator, which is a new catcher. Instead of using that, um, uh, that solitaire thing, now we use a human placenta to test it out. And we test it, I think, well, with, uh, with a lamb, we are working with this. Um, because the placenta is a very good model that can do it in vitro, those are blood vessels within the placenta, and we put those stains in, inside. This is how we do it. Uh, inside the stand, you can see the stand coming in and we start pulling it. You need to understand the mechanism of the side branch of the clot, whether the clot will fall on the stand, and how much damage when you're doing this to the inside lumen of the blood vessels. And it's very important. So we take the blood vessel out and then we do a histology study. And uh, this is the comparison of different stands. And we use also a uh, bifocal microscope to study the surface of the cell in the UST that we, we are looking at those endothelial linings, any damage. You know, this is solitaire. You lose a lot of uh, endothelial lining. The three separate seem to be uh, a bit better. So we need to know what is the best um, uh, clot, remo clot removing uh, device. Still under testing. The reason for that is when the clot start to, start to break off, if the clot is not engaged with that stain or that retriever uh, well enough, then it will disseminate and go somewhere else, which is uh, not good enough. So back to the patient we see at the beginning. He came in with completely blockage with the middle cerebral artery. This young man, 50 something odd years old. So we put a catheter there and put a retriever, pull out the first, first clot from the superior branch, and then the second pass we'll put in this the inferior branch, and we open up the whole middle cerebral artery on the right side. 
So this is the before and after. And after that, lo and behold, six months later, he come back to have uh, a retouch on the uh, cranium, and he can walk again with just a slight weakness on one on the uh, right uh, on the uh, left hand side. Still, see the left hand still a little bit weak. But otherwise, he is back to work. So this new this is the first case being done in Hong Kong, and we are pretty happy about it. Uh, without the use of uh, the uh, RPK, which is a clot-eating uh, clot uh, drugs. The drug itself have this problem, it will cause hemorrhage. Now, uh, in follow-up, we're using a very good skin uh, called the 320 motor size CT, a dynamic volume CT, and you can see there's still some problem with it. Although this guy is doing well, but he got some narrowing here. Is it the damage by the endothelial gadgets that we are pulling? We don't know. Is it because the patient already have a pre-existing lesion? Somewhere here, there's a reason why he got a stroke. We don't know. So this is the reason why we need to endeavor into further research. Now hopefully, in the future, the nanotechnology this is a bonkers. There's another lumen, which is our airway. Then we can tackle so many diseases within our lung using a nanotechnological devices, which is also can be delivered by various small zoo catheters. And uh, that's my conclusion, and thanks to uh, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Simon Court that have us in terms of research, and also uh, on the UGC branch, and we're working with uh, UST. So, thank you. I think, uh, <laughs> Professor Andy, The title is basically the devices for treatment. And as you can see, John is using basically not just knife and scalpel. He, he needs a lot of stuff. And of course, a lot of imaging techniques and so on. But most of all, he needs some devices to deal with those clots and those aneurysms. Well, I think. Um, the, the medical pictures are sometimes a little bit difficult to understand, so we come up with schematics for you to uh, get a better grasp on what these things are. We'll talk about two things, the aneurysm, aneurysm here, and strokes. In physical form, aneurysm is something that is a growth, it's a bubble on our vasculature, in this case, on a blood vessel. But what kind of blood vessel are we talking about here? In this case, it's a circle with this blood vessel in our brain. And in that thing, it's called a circle with this. And for some odd reasons, and only God knows perhaps, mm. that this area tends to have a bubble aneurysm. This is called intracranial aneurysm. And if we're not careful, this thing will rupture and we'll be in deep trouble. And you don't want your brain to bleed. The second thing I'd like to talk to you about, it's a very common thing. It's not a bubble, but it's also somewhere in the blood vessel. But in this case, we have a clot. And when you have a clot, you have a problem because blood vessel is delivering nutrients, oxygen, you, whatever not, to the parts of the body back here, especially the brain. If that is clogged, that area would no longer have the nutrients, particularly the oxygen it needs to survive, and it will die. And when it dies, then you lose your brain function part of it anyway, and you increasingly, you're approaching death. The guy you saw that uh, Dr. Clark had presented, his left side, right side, Left side was disabled because of the stroke. Okay, we have a very narrow window to save them. So I'd like to talk to you about basically what can we do about this and what can we do about that without cutting you open. Because cutting you open and then having you recover, especially in the brain, is not a good idea. Uh, 
Um, I would like to first talk to you about blockages. Basically, the blood clot destroys. Okay. Now, you can think of it, there are two ways to do it. Either you go in and use some wonderful drugs, and you hope to dissolve it. So you may have a stroke, and you provide it, a prior drug to you intravenously or interarterially. So we hope that after a while, maybe an hour or so, then your, your clot somewhere up in the brain or normally up in the brain will be dissolved. But then the drug is circulating throughout your vasculature. So it will attack not only the disease region, but anywhere else that it comes in contact with, and that will may that may cause problems for you. If dissolving clots, it may be dissolving something else. It's not selective, uh, not to the extent that we want it to be. The other one, which you have already seen a little bit of, is what the Dr. Kong have used, which is using a mechanical device. Send it through our groin, up through the vasculature, into the disease region, normally the brain, and we hope to catch it. Of course, we can catch it, but then the mechanism of this is try to expand the clot against the wall of the vessel. And when you do that, you may damage a very critical layer on the blood vessel, which is the endothelium cells, which what what Dr. Park has shown. There are some good ones and some bad ones. But regardless of the good ones and the bad ones, they're all producing damages. And you can see the last slides right here. So while we have some solutions right now, we need to do better. We need to do better. We need to reduce damage. Okay. We seek to do more harm. Here are some figures. This is the mechanical thermectomy, the one on the right hand side. And there's intravenous version of the drug, and there's an intra arterial ones. These are the success rate, if you will, the ability for the treatment to reopen the vessel. And depending on the technique, the red ones are the ones that shows you the damages that can occur. Okay. The ranges, depending on what study you want, is between 5 to 50 percent of the people would suffer vessel damage when you use mechanical technique. This is very new, so we don't have a lot of data on it. And using drugs sometimes works, sometimes doesn't, and also intraview. Okay, so these are the basically a sort of summary of all of these studies out there. We need to do what? We need to cut this down push this out. That's it. What you want? 99% if you can. 100% Okay. So let's talk about two ways to go about it. The first, so the first way I'm going to go about it is that let's try to dissolve it. But not from the arm. Let's send our agent to the location to where the clot is. Then, administer the drug, but do not let the drug flow to other vasculatures. Because if it does, it will then serve as an agent to attack that. What are we doing? Well, we have a device. We have some tubes in there. Magical tubes. What does it do? This is your blood vessel, let's say, and this is your clot. We'll first put a guy wire, we'll find the clot, pull our device in. Our device does three things. First, when it gets past the clot, it will send blood to the region that is blocked to give it more nutrients so that we will have a little bit more oxygen to go with instead of dying. Then these two tubes together will form a dissolution zone 
Remember the old way is that it circulates throughout the vascular channel. Don't want that. This tube will send the drug to dissolve it, while this tube with filters blocking anything to come out, would seek to dissolve it and then suck it back out. And this is sort of a recirculating zone that we have established inside the blood vessel. Okay, so that is the idea. Keep it going while we do our thing. Um, this is the experiment on the outside because it's very difficult to see through blood vessels. So let's take a look at what happens in the plastic transparent tube. This is a blood clot. To do a blood clot, we need a very special drug, okay, to dissolve blood clot. We cannot go and get, uh, you know, the, what, uh, the stuff that we use pipe cleaning for. That will destroy the blood vessels. So we need a very special enzyme to do this. So you get this special enzyme, and I'd like to draw your attention to the time. We'll start now in the initial state. This is the state, let's say, you have the clot in your brain. Oops. There we go. Let's play. At two minutes, at four minutes, I want to pay attention to the size. Nothing happening very much. It takes time for the drug to get the action. At 12 minutes, you begin to see a faint dissolution. 16 minutes. It's almost gone by half an hour, if we can get it in. Of course, at the same, at the same time, we're sending blood to your disease region. <coughs> Keep your life. That's gone. 30 minutes. A pretty quick clock. That's what we hope to do. We hope that this would not damage your endothelium cells, which may lead to constrictions afterward that you can see in the other case that we have presented. So we can do that. Stick it in. Hope that you can walk out of it quickly. Well, oh, it's a very great device. We have patented it. <laughs> the next thing I want to talk to you about, we'll come back to a summary later. That um, instead of dissolving it, there are some very stubborn clots that we don't have a drug for, and. For those things, we may need to really go in and just grab it. Grabbing it with this kind of stent or penumbra, the newest one, that you see sort of like, you know, lots of little forks there. They have fairly good success rate, but as you can see from our earlier study, there are still damages. We like to get rid of those damages, okay? So what we want to do, we're not dissolving it anymore, we are retrieving it. So it's a clot retrieval system. This is not a movie, but just a direct comparison between so-called the mechanical thermopactomy that we have shown you, and the new thing, the thermal mechanical thermopactomy. It's very simple, you start with a clot. You stick the, a mechanical thermopactomy in, and you found that after you pull it off, you still have a clot. Well, of course, depending on how you shape the device, you may be successful, may not be successful, may not be successful. The reason you're not successful here is because we intentionally avoided radially expanding against the vessel. We don't expand against the vessel, you don't damage it, but you don't damage it, and you also don't get a clot. Okay? If you expand against it, you will. You will get a clot, but you may damage the vessel wall. Using basically almost the same design. We put our device in there. 
We did not magic. And we pull. We pull, the difference between this and that is that there is really no claw left. No claw left. Just blood. And the evidence is in here. The claw was pulled out into the catheter. And then we go here. It's a corresponding one. Again, there's no radial force, but there's very little claw retrieved by this. Okay? So we now have two devices. We can dissolve it or we can retrieve it. Hopefully without extensive damage or minimal damage. <coughs> this is the case that we have done with the placenta and humans. The cannibal, little claw retrieved. Thermal mechanical, claw retrieved. On humans, well, placenta, not a lot, but a lot enough. <coughs> Okay? The third thing I think, I'm, my time is running up, so, so I, I need to speed up a little bit. This is the case for the end result again. The current treatment is to put platinum coils in there. And even if it cures you, the coils would be there for the rest of your life unless you cut it out. I don't think you want to cut it out because it would be washing over your brain. So it would be there. The ideal situation, of course, is for the platinum coil to do its job heal you, and then disappear. So that your blood vessel will be restored to its original, or as near original as we can. Well, I'm not showing the video for the permanent one. The permanent basically tells you, you get the one that we have. I'm going to show you a little bit <coughs> what it is, what we're talking about. In this case, the coil is no longer a metal. It is not just a polymer, but a biosorbable polymer. One that will be put in, the coating will be dissolved, induce clotting here so that the blood pressure will be brought down so that it wouldn't rupture, and then the coil will disappear the aneurysm will shrink away. In the permanent one, doesn't, because platinum core is there. It cannot shrink away. Okay. This is the case on, again, on a um, uh, polymer example. This shows you the coil, and shows the blood clot that's formed inside. It's very important to form a blood clot, because if you don't form a blood clot, <coughs> you don't form a blood clot, the pressure inside the organism will remain unchanged, but if we act as we had hoped, pressure will drop. And dropping the pressure means you don't have such a high risk of rupture. And that's what we want. And of course, give it time to shrink. Okay? So, this is what we've done so far. There are other things, but we have. Biosorbable coils for aneurysm. We can retrieve the cord, hopefully in a short time, without damage. And then we have a clot dilution device, which is basically localizing the clot dissolution. We hope that these will reduce damage to the vessel while relieving the, the basically the clot from the blood. Okay. And these handsome guys are the guys who did the real work, who put their names on its patents, so we have to acknowledge them. And maybe you took them a job. Yeah, I'm very happy, I'm sure. And I'd like to acknowledge, of course, the funding provided by the University Commission, the University Grants Commission, and mm -hmm. least of, a lot, well, last but not least, Mrs. Mrs. Simon. And if you can, Welcome your support. That's all. That's a bitch. <laughs>